security review is conducted by the CISO and is done during, uh, as part of the design phase. Um, we simply go over the design, we present the design, and the CISO is focused, very focused on threat modeling of identifying possible uh, um, uh, threats in the design. How does it work? It works also as part of the release planning. It means then when we start the release and we see the list of all features, then we say, okay, this one and this one, these features that the CISO must review. How do we select them? We have certain qualifiers. If they have something to do with authentication, with encryption, with communication between servers, stuff like that, they must go uh, and be reviewed by the CISO. Um, we are now at the heart of and soul of the development. We reach to the heart and soul of the process. We are in the development phase. And at this point, I would like to introduce you to Tom. This is Tom. He is a Java backend developer. He is part of IAS team. By the way, Tom actually looks like this because everyone looks like this now in Tel Aviv. <laughs> <laughs> so just to get you into the story, this all, all true. So Tom uh, manages his code in Git. He, his ALM is managed in Jira. Uh, his CI is, managed, is based on Jenkins as he's working with IntelliJ. Tom likes to code. He does not like distractions, distractions. And he, he comes to work, he likes to put his headphones and to get into the zone. Okay? So here is a day in Tom's life. The day begins with a daily meeting. The team is uh, meeting together. They open the, the backlog in the JIRA. They review the issues. They prioritize. Uh, they talk about it and assign the task. And Tom is assigned with the task. What does he do? Put the headphones, get into the zone. So he starts developing. And once he's done, he commits the code. This will trigger the CI process, CI based on Jenkins. Now the CI will start. <coughs> it will start with uh, build and unit testing. And then is the scanning. We scan our code using our own Jenkins plugin. If you will go to Jenkins Marketplace, you will find Checkmarks plugin there. Um, so we scan using our own plugin. Um, it's a very short scan, it's an incremental scan. Uh, it can take, in my teams, it takes like a minute uh, tops. So it's a very short scan. Remember, this is, yeah, it should be short. The next step is component testing, automated component testing. And this is where IAST come into place. You remember, IAST is the interactive application testing, the ones that running while the, the testing are, uh, while the the testing are running. So IAS is deployed on the same servers that are running the automation, and IAS started scan. Assuming that all scans completed, artifact is being, load, is being uploaded to the artifactory. From then, it will go to end-to-end -to -end, uh, automated testing. And another thing happened, and this is the magic. CX flow is a rather new uh, product of checkmarks that closes the loop automatically. What do I mean? It closes the loop back to the Jira. What do I mean by that? Let's imagine that Tom in the zone committed a code with a SQL injection. Okay, the scan, SAS scan identified it. Now there is an open uh, issue, there is a result. What CX flow will do is take the result from the issue from the scan and will open a bug, a ticket in Jira. And boom, we are in the zone. Nothing happened and we are in Tom's life. The next time that Tom will open the backlog, he will, he will see the bug. It doesn't require him to open a report, open a different portal, do something else. It's simply there. And what, what is even more cool that Tom is a responsible developer, and he, he noticed the bug, and he wants to fix it, because there is a definition of done. He wants to close it, so he will commit the fix. SAS scan will not find now the issue, 
and CX flow will close the ticket. Everything is the closed, the loop is closed. I promise to talk about awareness. So awareness is something that we do all the time. It's an ongoing effort, effort uh, to answer those questions that you asked about knowledge, about uh, time that will take developers to analyze false positive. And I would like to um, dedicate for it a few slides because we really believe that this is a, a key. So let's imagine. Why is uh, awareness is so important? Let's imagine that all the developers in your organization uh, knew how to avoid security vulnerabilities from the first place. So it's a nice vision. Everyone are happy. Your scans are clean. The CISO loves you. Everyone are happy, except for me, because I don't have a job anymore. But seriously, not having security vulnerabilities at all will probably, it's, it's probably uh, something that will not uh, happen. Still, we need to aspire to reduce them to bare minimum. We invest a lot of time and efforts and money in resolving the security issues. Awareness is about investing some of these efforts in preventing them from happening at first place. So what do I mean? When I thought to myself, so what is awareness? How to raise awareness? I came up with three things. You need people to care, so you need to engage them. Uh, you need people to know, uh, you need to train them. And you need people to always have security in their minds. So you need to create a buzz. Um, code bashing also takes, takes significant place in this uh, in, in engagement and I will share with you some examples that I have done during the past year and a half. Some are using code bashing, some not, and you can just uh, get uh, some ideas. So we're talking about fun. This is uh, uh, something that we did, I think, uh, five or six months ago in my group. We had a special day event around security. We called it Cyber Monday, although no online shopping was done. And uh, we had a competition between the teams and we told them they had challenges like uh, complete all your, all your code bashing lessons and there was a Kahoot, you know what Kahoot is? It's like a questionnaire with ranking. So uh, questionnaire obviously around application security and they had, to, they had a competition on who solved the most uh, security bugs. So, and it was a lot of fun. And there was a winner, there was prizes, there were prizes and you get, a, you get the picture. Prizes, tournaments, competition, readers, it makes the difference. Code bashing as a solution for training. So you mentioned how do we train the developers. You remember Tom, Tom now in his zone and and as was mentioned here, the ticket already in Jira, but Tom not does not necessarily know how to analyze the issue. He does not necessarily know how to fix it. And he certainly not necessarily, does not necessarily know how to avoid it from the first place. So what we do here is to invest on training. And the code bashing is a, is a great solution for training. Um, it is very gamified. You can see this is the dashboard. You can see leaderboard and badges, and we are about to have tournaments. Um, it's built like courses uh, covering 45 uh, vulnerabilities in different uh, frameworks and languages. And there is Alice, the developer, and there is always an action to do. Click next to open the network sniffer. And there, there will be some coding to do. Um, so it's very interactive and engaging, it's a lot more different than to uh, read a very dry description of SQL injection. You can all agree about that. So that's something to make the difference. But it's something that you can do either with code bashing, with your emails, with the hanging posters, with riddles on the wall and maybe a Q QR code. Think of anything that can spice things up. Last. Last, I'm going to talk a bit about our challenges. I selected the two challenges that are currently um, 
you know, occupying me. The first and foremost, the eternal challenge, how to prioritize security issue versus backlog. So no fairy tales here, no magic solutions. It's a challenge that we have every day. I can share with you my two cents um, about how to address it and things that help us. So first, it goes back to the, the ecosystem rule. As much as the issues are part of the development process, the less friction. I'm taking you back to Tom with the SQL injection issue. It was, it was part of the backlog. So it's, it's no longer security issue versus backlog because the SQL injection is part of the backlog and is now the problem of the team and the product to work on it. And assuming that you have a strong agile methodology uh, about definition of done and about zero bug policy, then it all combines together and it will push to resolution. And the second thing is uh, robust automated testing. So they found themselves, okay, I have a new CVE, so now I'm thinking, I will, uh, if I will, uh, and it's an open source CVE, so if I need now to upgrade to a, a most updated library, they started to think it will take me a lot of time to test, it's, it's manually testing. So they started investing all the time in analysis. Is this CVE really uh, exploitable in my situation? Um, maybe it's not an issue. Uh, they spent all the time in the analysis and at, at one point the team leader came to me and, say, and said, I'm, this is all what I'm doing. I'm doing analysis. I'm not developing any new features. And at this point we decided that the best solution here would be uh, to um, invest more resources, ramp up the automation so that the next time now if there are several CVEs, so we say, okay, let's upgrade. Automa the testing will cover it and Okay, exploitable, not exploitable, relevant to us, not relevant, it doesn't matter, let's, uh, let's update. So this is uh, something uh, that we implemented and differentiating between um, tech debt or legacy issues and versus new bugs. This is something that you need to agree, uh, R&D need to agree with the PM, it can also be agreed in the policy, but um, imagine this product that was never scanned and now has like thousands of issues. You can't expect the team to stop developing for a year and fix them. So you can create a policy that says, okay, we're starting from now on. Every new issue is being attended at the same sprint, at the following sprint. And about the legacy, let's build a plan. Let's uh, tackle five issues per sprint. It will take us 10 sprints, okay? Um, I mentioned at the beginning that we are growing and this growth also brings challenges because it's one thing to have uh, an R&D, to have application security in an R&D of 20 people and it's a different story when it's more than 100 people. So what we, and it's all about the knowledge and the training and the expertise. So we are currently initiating a program of security champions program, which with the goal of scaling uh, the security skill across the organization. Uh, hopefully it, we, have a, we will have a security champion per every group. Um, the main challenge actually here is to find those developers that has strong skill and orientation to, to application security. Uh, and then to train them and have them serve as first level experts um, to the developers in the group, like conducting reviews, like uh, um, uh, analysis, um, analyze issues, uh, and so on. Um, I already started to see that in some groups there is an abuse that we should be aware of it and be beware of it. Um, that uh, once you nominated a security champion, then uh, some groups may think that, okay, he is the owner of security in the group. And this is very wrong. The owner is the team. It's like any other quality issue. This is an expert uh, that can help you, that can guide you. Ownership remains with the team. So before we conclude, uh, recap. 
the three main things that I want you to take out uh, from this session. Focus on your developers. Be in the zone. As we said. Invest on automation to make the process seamless. And last but not least, make people care, engage them, and don't forget to have fun. That's it for me. Thank you.